Good afternoon. Great to see all of you here today. In spite of the so-called bad news about snow, I'll tell you, the media is really getting to us, isn't it? We talked about the uh, great progress being made in the veteran project. I just want to remind you that uh, the Air Museum at the Willow Grove Naval Air Station is open. It's open on Wednesdays from 10 in the morning until 8 at 8 at night. And it is open on Saturdays from 10 until 4. It's a great opportunity for you to see really what great things have happened in aviation in this area. You may not, you may not really understand what was happening here years ago, but it's, a, it's an opportunity for you to come up and, uh, and take part in that experience. I'm going to introduce the speaker first, and then we're going to have the invocation and the uh, pledge to the flag. Our speaker today is Stanley Hoffman. He served in the U.S. Army Air Corps in the 15th Air Force, stationed in Foggia, Italy. He's in the 97th Bomb Group. And he was there from January of 45 until August of 45. Would you please stand and we'll uh, pledge the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In uh, stead of a vocation, invocation, I thought that I would read a poem that was sent to me a few weeks ago. It's called In Honor of Them. And since our speaker was from the Air Force, this has a, a flyer's bent to it. When next you raise your eyes up toward the gray wind-swept clouds, spare a thought for all those brave young men who fell from its open skies. So many lost, holding lifeless controls, fire and smoke, burning and choking, spinning out of life, cockpits forever jammed, a final kiss for yet another sweetheart left behind, shot down while bombing countless places of faceless places. Unknown others rest at the bottom of the vast oceans, the wide seas, the dense forests, and in fields of peaceful green. No gravestones to mark their last stop. A final place of peace to where family, lovers, and friends cannot let tears nor fresh flowers drop. Today, the remaining bomber bases stand exposed to the forces of nature. Most are quiet and lonely places. The unvalued guardians of history, abandoned by all but their ever young dead. The dead who wait patiently for the time to come when once again they may embrace eternal friends. Together they will walk with loving hands placed on shoulders into a light where they will find no fear nor hate. And where old foes are brothers once again, look up to the skies now and then and think a little just in honor of them. I'd like to present our speaker, Stanley Hoffman. Stanley? As I was sitting there, Wait till we get the lights okay. Cut the lights there. Mm 
As I was sitting there, I saw that picture flash up there, and I said, who was ever so young? I don't, I don't remember ever, but I was just, I enlisted when I was 17 years old. They would not take me in the Air Corps, and one of my eyes were too weak to get into the Navy and Marine Corps and Coast Guard, which I tried. And uh, the Air, I wanted to be a pilot, and I could not because of the weak eye. But I found out they would take me in the uh, training program for uh, uh, glider pilots, which I'm very happy. I, they closed the glider schools the week I got in. <laughs> and I, I never was so happy over anything. Most, most of them got killed, you know, in action. And uh, what they did, they trained me to be an aircraft mechanic. They sent me to, after basic training in Miami Beach, now, it sounds wonderful. Oh, they send you down to Miami Beach. You were quartered in a hotel. We had to scrub the floors of those hotel rooms every single day with soap and water. In fact, we ruined them all. They had to get new flooring in them. But you're not supposed to scrub those floors. Uh, and uh, when I got out of there, they sent me to aircraft mechanic school in uh, Chicago, Illinois, to the Aeronautical University, where they put me in a hotel, too for a while, the Stevens Hotel, and they put me in a, uh, at the YMCA in uh, on Wabash Avenue. That's a place I loved the most at Chicago. It was a great place to be. And they tried to train me to be an aircraft mechanic. Now, I'm going to let you know something. The mechanics that got out of school, unless they knew something about it before they went into service, didn't know a heck of a lot more after they got out of school was they had this crash course in a three uh, crews a day. You know, early shift, day shift, nights, round the clock, they would be training men. And the teachers didn't know a great deal either. And it's a miracle, I think it's a real miracle that uh, we went through training at all, with, uh, the people who went through training at all who were trained on these fighter planes that we were trained to fix. Because uh, I understand the amount of mechanical failure was so great that we lost a lot of men in, in it. Uh, I hated it. I despised it. Even though I was fairly good at it, I, was, I wasn't good at it at all, but just fair. And I said, no, this is not for me. I want to just go out and work. Oh, no, we, you, you're doing a wonderful job, they told me. And they wanted to send me to, and they did send me to specialist school on Allison engines at the Buick Division of Allison Engine out in Indianapolis, Indiana, to be an engine overhaul specialist. I felt I was pretty bad at it. They claimed I was very good. I, I don't think their standards were very high. And I told them, this is the end. I don't want it. They say, oh, no, we're going to send you to another one. And they didn't, of course. They, they, I said, no way. So they put me on the line out in the small town, it's a, all it had was an Indian village there, out in Oregon, Redmond, Oregon. And I was working practically around the clock, day and night, but they couldn't train the pilots fast enough, fixing airplanes. They made me a crew chief. And then they made me a troubleshooter. When a mechanic didn't know what was wrong, all I did was go over and I told him what's wrong and he'd fix it. How this ever happened, I don't know to this day, because I am not a mechanic. Uh, and uh, I hated it so much, and I wanted to fly. That's why I went in. And uh, I understood that the gunners were needed very badly, aerial gunners, because they were losing a lot of them, to uh, mostly to German flak and German fighters. And I applied for gunnery school and was taken. They sent me to uh, Las Vegas gunnery school. But I know that sounds odd, but it was out in the desert. It was nowhere near the city. You had to drive. And in this school, they were so strict, they would not let us ever go to Las Vegas. And while I was in, I was in California before that in a distribution center, I met a girl in Los Angeles who I liked. And we'd uh, commu uh, communicate with each other by mail. And she was a very wealthy young lady. And her parents loved to gamble in Las Vegas. And she wrote me there, mother, father, and she will be there at a certain time. And I was just dying to see her and get in town. 
I did something I never did before and never did since. Someone got, got hold of it, a blank pass, and I filled it out and put my captain, and I just scribbled anything which could be read, and I got to town to see her. And <laughs> I think of that today, and I say, I'd be scared to death to do something like that today, but I did it. And uh, when I got through with gunnery school, incidentally, in gunnery school, this is where I first saw this plane. We were told we were going for B-17 training, fortress training. And uh, I remember from the PX there, I was looking across the airfield, just staring at it. And I scribbled a letter home to my mom and dad. I was 18 years old then. I said, Mom, I have fallen very much in love with a wonderful, wonderful love. And she is beautiful, she's complex to understand, and she sometimes gets me very, very angry because we, she doesn't do exactly as I want. And uh, my mother was thinking, hey, who did he meet? And uh, I said, unfortunately, our love can never end in marriage because I love the B-17 Flying Fortress. And I really did. I found that plane so great that I think I'll never forget it. It saved our lives so many times. And uh, we were shipped to Lincoln, Nebraska, where pilots just fresh out of pilot school and co-pilots, navigators, bombardiers, and gunners were shipped. Now, because they made an engineer gunner out of me, you know, a, a sort of a flying mechanic, and the top turret, the spurry upper turret here, up on top with the two machine guns. Uh, they were training me there, and uh, it's after the training, uh, ra rather after the training, we all got together in, in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, where they put pilots, co-pilots, and so forth. They formed crews there. And then they sent us out to Dyersburg, Tennessee, for what they call uh, phase training or uh, air training. And we flew planes, the likes of which you wouldn't believe existed. They were put together with scotch tape and, I mean, I don't know how they were put together. We lost huge amounts of men or died because of that too. Because those planes crashed and the, they, they couldn't help it. They just didn't have any other planes. They were, B, they were earlier B-17s. Now this is a G, the later model. Like a lot of the turret here, the Ds didn't have this bell, uh, this uh, bottom turret and the navigator. Uh, they didn't have a lot of things. Uh, there were now here is an airplane, which if you look at it, and today it's it looks small. I saw it recently down at the airport, airport North. They had one on display, and this is just tiny in comparison to what they really are, uh, to what we see today. But we thought it was an enormous thing, and it was. 103 feet and four inch wingspan. It holds 1,780 gas, but they, in the later models, they put what they call Tokyo tanks in them, and they 1,000 more gallons, so it was 2,780 gallons of gas. We usually carried a 6,000 pound bomb load in the bomb bay here, and uh, we carried various type bombs for various type things. For instance, if we were bombing most of the time, it would be uh, 12 500-pound bombs. Yeah, 12 500. If we were bombing, a, uh, say, a factory, we were bombing a uh, railroad depot, uh, we always use those on the oil refineries. They seem to be best. On certain targets, we carried 1,000-pound bombs, six of them. And uh, on uh, one, I remember, which I, I hated, we carried cluster bombs, which were anti-personnel bombs of 250 pounds each. Now, they, we had a problem with those, which the Air Force never fixed. I cannot understand why. Uh, you know, the bomb bay has two sides to it, two walls inside. Bombs are one above the other each wall. Well, the 250-pounders 
had these uh, clamps which would open up. Well, they all had the clamps. They'd open up when the bombardier pulled his, and they'd drop out. But for some reason, the shackles which held the 250-pound bombs thick. The bomb would be hanging by, instead of two hooks, one hook, and it would be banging from side to side, and you're all kid. And that's very, you never know what's going to happen then. And uh, someone has to do something. <laughs> I was delegated for this wonderful job because my position in the plane as top turret gunner was on the flight deck. That's the top turret is. See the flight deck? The pilot's here. I don't know if I'm showing it properly, but the pilot's here. Co-pilot's here. And the engineer is right behind them, with the, right in front of the top turret. And when the, he has, has to, to use the guns, you just step backwards and you get in the top turret. At any rate, uh, the, uh, we were uh, attacked by a plane, which, well, let, I'll get to the beginning of the story. We were flying over a place uh, called uh, Bologna, northern Italy. And we had a bomb, a, uh, what was it we were bombing? A railroad marshalling yard where they have the trains with soldiers and uh, ammunition uh, on the tracks. And so any aircraft shells started to come up at us. I'll tell you a little more about any aircraft shells in a minute. I'm jumping around a little. Any aircraft shells are timed. I don't know whether you're familiar with them. They're, uh, 80, the Germans used 88 millimeters and 105s. And uh, that's the size of them. The 88 were smaller but more deadly because they were so accurate with them. For some reason, they were not accurate with their 105s. They they were always far above us, too high, to do too much damage. And uh, I guess uh, nobody ever told the Germans that, hey, you know, you're, you're making those things go too high. You're not going to get anybody. But, but the 88s were, I think, the deadliest gun of World War II, the 88 millimeters. And uh, what happens? The sky gets here. I took this picture myself. My, when I left for the service, my older sister gave me a I think they used to cost three dollars and something then, which was a lot of money. A baby brownie box camera, and I and I leaned out out the side of my the uh, co-pilot's window, or or uh, when the bomb babe door was open, I'd lean out and take pictures. Here is the tail of our plane. You can see some places it was hit while it was from the flak, from the anti-aircraft flak. And uh, see those black things? They're 88s bursting, 88 millimeters. There were uh, uh, this was taken at the uh, Vienna oil refineries. There were 480 guns shooting at once at us, 88s. And the sad part about it, people say, well, why didn't you avoid it? You're flying in formation. And in order to get from your position to your target, you have to fly a very rigid course, which the navigator has. And when you get close to your target, actually, the pilot doesn't fly the plane. The bombardier is flying the plane. He, he is, uh, I mean, steering it, not flying it. I'll say they're flying, but he is steering it, trying to get right over the target with the, his mechanism. Uh, and these planes would uh, blow up all around you, which was really upsetting. Because I, here, here I, was, I was a kid from South Philly that didn't, you know, I never was in an airplane before, let alone have this happen. And I remember in my first mission, they wouldn't let me fly the upper turret because I was too new, too uh, green. So they wanted to fly me in an easier position where I wouldn't have too much responsibility. So they flew me left waist, which was right here, waist gun, right here. These little windows on the side. and. Uh, and left waist, you, you just have to remember to fire your guns, nothing else. And, yeah, and the, the I notice, you see over there, see that, those flashes? You can see the flashes from the ground where the guns are going off. I don't know if you can notice it. Way over there. And uh, you flew in a, in a seven-plane squadron. Each squadron consisted of seven planes. 
Uh, you have, like, we, we usually were a Charlie group. That means a third group back, Abel, Baker, Charlie. Abel would be a lead group. Then they had two wing groups, Baker, Charlie, then one a lower one, little behind, a uh, dog. And that's the way you flew. And, uh, but you try to get your wings as close together as possible. This was extremely important. And the one other wonderful thing about the P-17, the pilot had good visual uh, sight of his way and good control. Wonderful control of the plane. It was maneuverable. And uh, that way, the fighters couldn't fly between your planes to hit you. They wouldn't dare. They couldn't get through. Anyway, you flew so close, which is an interesting factor because a lot of people speak of B-24s, the Liberator bombers, which were the other bomb group we had there. They're heavy bombers. They equated them with the B-17s. In fact, in some ways they were better, in some ways they were worse. And I don't know if you'd be interested in this, it's technicality. What made them better or worse? This plane uh, was about five miles an hour slower than a B-24, this B-17 Fortress. The B-24 carried a much, much heavier bomb load. I forgot what it was, but it was much heavier than this. The B-24 went faster. The B-24 uh, could carry a heavier payload of other things, too, armor and that sort of thing. But they had a da something called a Davis wing, and the Davis wing limited it. it. The pilots could not see his wingtips well. Therefore, they had to fly a loose formation. Uh, we could maneuver this thing in anywhere and fly. And the B-24s, they can do a 45-degree bank without going into a spin, which means if they have to make a sharp bank like that, they will go into a spin. And uh, that's pretty dangerous. And uh, so we look, and now if you look at the statistics, I think we lost a great deal more 24, uh, fours than 17. We were not bothered much by fighters at all. I, I know people don't want to believe this. But if we had 24s along with us, which we did, the fighters would let us alone often and just go after the 24s. They could fly right through their formations. So 24s were much more dangerous. Uh, many people have asked me, what is the most dangerous position in the plane? Why are so many men killed or where? Where is a safer place? Well, I can't say, but there's one position I think I would have gone AWOL if I had to fly, but it scared the heck out of me. And that's the ball turret, the belly turret down here. And they only took, usually only took short men, the shortest man unhappily had to have the ball because you crawl up with your knees and your chest in a glass ball and two machine guns and you're all alone down there. You can't see your own plane. Someone has to close the lid behind you up in the, in the waist in the floor. And it is scary. It is scary just flying in it. But you're just all alone. And my bull turret gunner showed it. Uh, my first mission, as I was saying, let me get back to it. I'm skipping around a lot. Uh, they put me in the waist position. And I stood there and I was saying to myself, hey, this is just like the movies. Look. Bang, these, these are shooting at us. And I never thought that, you know, someone can get killed here. Uh, but it just didn't enter my mind. I'm watching a movie as I did as a kid at the Ideal Movie in South Philly. And, uh, and it was so interesting. And I was thinking, hey, I got these guns now. Do I remember everything they taught me in gunnery school? And, and right beside me, off my left wing, this plane with the open bomb bay door got a direct hit. And it just blew up an orange puff. That's what it was. Debris, maybe bodies. I don't know. I was so scared. Bodies flying, everything from it. And I just pulled my, my flak helmet down and crouched behind the armor plating in the waist for a minute. And uh, the man on the other uh, season, the flyer. See, they don't fly here with your own crew the first mission where we were. They fly you with a seasoned crew so you get used to it. Your pilot goes with another he flies co-pilot with someone else, and your navigator goes in and with another crew. And this fellow tapped me on the shoulder. He was like, you, you can't hear up there, so you have to, because the engines are so loud, there's no soundproofing. And he shouts in my ear, OK, come on up, and he laughs. And I came up. Incidentally, it is the only, no, one other time I got scared. 
Uh, only twice I really got frightened up there because I was too stupid to get frightened. Really, uh, I just felt nothing in the world can hurt me. I'm, I'm not, this is not real. I'm just a kid from South Philly. It's never even been in an airplane. And, and, here, and here I am doing this. And uh, uh, we later on had an, an interesting experience with, uh, we flew a lot of missions. We flew to, I went on seven at the uh, oil refineries of Vienna. In fact, the other day I looked at this, and it was the 14th of February when I, this was that picture you see, it's from the Valentine's Day raid on Vienna in 1945. And uh, they had 480 guns, and incidentally, no soldiers were manning those guns. They were manned by women who lived in Vienna. They just drafted these civilian women to man the guns down there and taught them how. And they were good. They were really good at their job. 480. Uh, we went to Graz, Austria, Linz, Austria. One of our terrible targets was Blechhammer. Southern, in southern Germany. And uh, the worst mission we ever went, where I saw the most men planes shot down, was Augsburg, Germany. Augsburg was a dreaded target of ours. It was horrible. And uh, we, we had a colonel. I still think he's crazy, but uh, he got really angry that the 8th Air Force in England was getting a lot and there's a good reason for that. They did the same thing pretty much. Uh, if you could draw a, an imaginary line through the country of Germany, through the center of it, and the northern part, and all countries north of that line, when it needed heavy bombing, the 8th Air Force out of England would take care of it. Anything south of that line, the 15th, our Air Force would take care of it. Now, there's a good reason for that, of course, because you can only carry so much gas at a certain altitude. You know, the higher up you go, the more gasoline you use, because you're, uh, well, I won't get into technicalities, but that's, that's the way it works. This colonel decided, we're going to make the newspapers get as much PR as the 8th Air Force gets. We're going to fly an impossible mission. And he picked one, Berlin. Now. We, everybody knew that we didn't, it was impossible to bomb Berlin because a B-17 doesn't carry enough gasoline at 27,000 feet with a 6,000 pound bomb load to go to Berlin and back. Just can't do it. Yes, you can. So we did it. Two planes, there are seven planes to a squadron, you know, in that formation, we were always in the Number four, general, not always, generally number four. There's a first plane, two on a side, this one a little lower, and two behind them. And uh, we had seven planes, and uh, two of us came back from that mission, two planes. Now, the others weren't killed, though, in our squadron. In fact, uh, there was an island called Vis, or pronounced it Vis, I don't know, off the coast of Yugoslavia, which we had a secret air base. And uh, if a man was wounded aboard your plane, or you had some mechanical trouble, or you shot up and you couldn't make it back, you headed for this. Landed on that airfield. And most of uh, those other planes landed on the airfield. We made it back. It was the longest raid in the history of the European war. And uh, we got back there. And I remember, <laughs> it's, it's a little aside, a story. Uh, when you get back, the first thing you do is get interrogated. Uh, there was a, like a, an old farmland with a, you know, these picnic tables with two benches on each side of it, the long ones. We were sitting there, and we were so tired because we were flying for so many hours that I remember uh, our heads, we got the black mark from our oxygen mass around our face, and our heads were sort of half on the table, and this captain who's going over, he wants to know. Uh, your coordinates, that means what uh, latitude and longitude you dropped your bombs, and all the little questions, technical questions like that. And uh, there was a woman that got on the GI truck when we landed. We couldn't even get out of the plane. We just dropped out of the, there was a, a nose entrance right over there, like a little, 
just held there and dropped to the ground and picked ourselves up, got on the back of the truck. We, we, because when you're in oxygen for so many hours, your red corpuscles break down. Technically, that's the reason. And you're so weak, and particularly you need some liquid in you. So, you, so the truck takes you to there. We, and was, this woman who wore this blue uniform, which is what uh, when a woman would wear if she was like in the press corps or something came over there. And she went in the back. Nobody spoke to her because we were just too tired to utter a sound. And uh, she followed us to the interrogation table. And uh, the interrogator said to my navigator, did you get your coordinates? And he came up with a rather crude mar remark, joking around. And then he looked at her and said, oh, excuse me, ma'am, I'm so sorry. And she said, oh, that's all right. And her name was Claire Booth Luce. You might have heard of her. And she had coffee with us, which we had old tin cans, you know, like from tomatoes or something. They washed them out, and the Red Cross would pour coffee in them outdoors, and we were sitting and talking and drinking coffee. And then we went back to our tents, and uh, they, the Air Force gave you two ounces of each flyer. You went into the medic's tent or hut, whichever they had, and he'd be standing there, and he'd sign your name, and he pours two ounces of American whiskey, which you down. Uh, it's supposed to sort of help you perk up after all those hours of flying on oxygen. And uh, there were a few guys that, I remember my ball turret gunner hated whiskey, and so did Ken Pianzi, my, right, uh, my right waist gunner. So they'd pour it in, and we'd go back to the tent and get a, a bottle of beer. They didn't have cans of uh, and, oh, incidentally, how do we keep the beer cold? We dug a little hole. We'd pull up a floorboard in the tent, and we'd put the, uh, 100 octane gasoline, which we had a, a little can of outside to, to keep our fire going in the winter. And we'd pour it in there, and uh, gasoline is very cold. And we'd it in, not on the neck of the bottle so that we didn't taste from gas, and cover it up, and they'd keep it cool in the summer. Uh, and the, I'd carry a can of beer, and uh, my bull turret gunner would hand me his, he'd get his shot sign for it and hand it back to me, and I'd down it with a bottle of beer, and then get my own. <laughs> uh, I'm not a drunk <laughs> or anything, but uh, I, the biggest problem I had over there was food. Now you say, why, why food? Uh, my, my, uh, even my uh, crew did not know this. I've been a vegetarian since I was eight years old. I come from a family of big meat eaters, but I saw a chicken killed when I was a kid and a fish the same day. And I was so upset at the age of eight. I kept telling my mom and dad, how can you murder an animal and eat its corpse and have your stomach be at cemetery? <laughs> I said, that feels pain and no suffering. How could you do that? And my father would quote the Bible. and. Uh, and I said, no, God couldn't be that cruel. Never could God be that cruel and do a horrible thing like that. And I, I tried to eat it, and I'd get nauseous. And the idea of eating a, de a corpse of a dead animal, a body. And I, as I got older, I even felt stronger about it. In fact, today my wife's a gourmet cook and vegetarian meal. She's not a vegetarian. My sons weren't raised that way. but. Uh, and my friends hate me when we go out for dinner because I'm such a pain in the neck, you know, to try to get something you can eat. Because, uh, well, at any rate, that's beside the point, just a little aside. Well, anyway, I was so hungry when I got back from that Berlin raid that I went to the mess hall and it was late because we got back so late and all they had were, I don't know what kind of, I don't know one meat from the other. And the, I went back to my tent and I was saving a bottle of Aste Spumante. It's an Italian champagne. And I just downed the bottle. I couldn't see straight. I just walked in a mess hall, and I started to eat it. And I was throwing up for days afterward. I did. But I, I was so sick. The idea just whew, got me so upset. But, but that's beside the point. <laughs> we went on many missions, a lot of them. and. Uh, each one had its own thing. One of them, we went to uh, northern Italy. And uh, I started to tell you about this one then. We, uh, we got one of our engines shot up a little. And we could fly with three engines. The B-17 would fly with one engine. It's the greatest plane ever made. 
uh, we, we were flying with three engines, but we couldn't keep up with our formation to get to our target. So uh, the lead ship, the colonel in the lead ship said, I'll tell you what, there's a small railroad bridge in a small village here. It has to be knocked out. There's no flak. He didn't tell me. He told over the intercom talking to my pilot. You go there. Um, and we were singing, um, the whole group, you know, we were singing songs to each other. Flak, no fighters there. And, uh, and then something happened. DI went out on us. Plane direction indicator. It's and you, you can drop your bombs. And something beautiful happened. My pilot had us, showed how democratic we were in the Air Corps, had us vote. See, if we didn't drop, we would not get credit for that mission. Each, uh, each Air Force had different rules. The of missions, the Air Force, you had to do so many missions. We didn't have a mission system. We had a sortie system, which was very different. You had to fly so many sorties, not missions. At any rate, uh, the, he said, uh, should we drop the bombs and get credit for the mission? And everyone said, no, you'll kill people because you can't be accurate, you know, hit the bridge. We did not drop our bombs. On the way home, we dropped them in the Adriatic Sea. We might have killed a lot of fish, but uh, we didn't kill any people. And, uh, but at any rate, I looked across. I was sitting up in my top turret. And I looked at 11 o'clock high, and I saw a black twin-engine plane. But it was so far off that I couldn't tell what, what it was. Now, we had no black planes that were colored black. And it was going so fast, I couldn't believe it. What plane could travel at such a speed? Now, I knew jets existed, but I had never seen a jet. It was a Messerschmitt 262, a, a German jet. And uh, I called out. Uh, Unidentified aircraft, 11 o'clock high, tension gunners, get ready. We all got our guns ready, but you can't shoot a plane that far off, you know, too far, way out of line. And then he start making a pursuit curve at us. A pursuit curve is a special way that you attack a plane. That's what you have to learn in gunnery school, uh, how to shoot at a plane in a pursuit curve. I'll, I'll just tell you about that as soon as I finish this. That, that's very interesting. And he's coming toward us, and with three engines, no way could we stand up against a plane like that. No way. And out of nowhere, nowhere, but they weren't, I don't, as far as I know to this day, they weren't supposed to be in that area. Two, of, we, they were down a road from us, I knew that, the Tuskegee Airmen. And uh, it's a, an all uh, uh, Afro-American uh, flying outfit. And, uh, they were flying these P-51s. They came out of nowhere, and they were on a tail of this uh, Messerschmitt, two of them. And, and this Messerschmitt 262 went into a dive, straight down. Now, they couldn't keep up with them in the flight, because uh, they were prop planes, of course. In the dive, they could. And I saw tracers going, and big puff, no shoot came out of it. and. Uh, then they came over to us, and they, they were sort of, and we're waving to them, they're waving to us, and they're, they're pounding around, making faces, and some of them did something that scared the heck out of us, because they start doing barrel rolls around us, <laughs> and, uh, you know, acrobatics, and our wings, if your wings touch, you all go down, <laughs> and, uh, and then they gave goodbye and took off. Now, we, we had no idea who they were until we got down on the ground, and the intelligence officer told us, uh, but I have uh, recently, I met a man at the post office who knew these, some of these men living in the Philadelphia area. And I, when I told him that story, he gave me a phone number of one who called me and wrote me a letter and said, come to our meetings. It's a, it last Thursday of every month. It was in, we meet in Overbrook Park in West Philly. I just never got around to it, but uh, it was, it's a wonderful thing. Now, uh, the one other thing, I remember I told you about people. I want you to know, everyone thinks of the great heroes who flew. I'll tell you about our crew. We came from every part of the country, every ethnic background, not every, because blacks were separated, so there were no blacks, but we came from most ethnic backgrounds. And uh, 
different people, very different. We were very different from one another. Uh, my bull turret gunner was rather compulsive. We, we oh, I'm sorry, here they are. I should. Uh, here's my pilot, Walter S. Moe. Brilliant man who recently, I was on the phone with him recently, he lost his wife and I called and sent condolences. He was supposed to become a general. He stayed in, he was a full colonel and he got a heart attack in the service and they wouldn't give him the generalship if he had a heart attack and so he retired. Uh, quite, a, quite a man, wonderful pilot. Here's Bob Leeming, my co-pilot who came from uh, Detroit, Michigan. I talked to him on the phone recently because he just lost his wife too, both of them. And uh, he, he was an interesting fella. He, <laughs> he had one fault though. He'd get vertigo occasionally. And he'd be flying this way instead of straight up. And my pilot says, what are you doing? He said, look at your instruments. He said, oh, the instruments are broken. They're not right. Look, I'm looking out there and I'm flying straight. <laughs> this used to get us a little annoyed sometimes. And here is Al Lowenkron from Brooklyn. Uh, now, Al was the best na navigator that I ever came across. Am I going too long? I'm going to say, no, it's all right. Uh, he was the, one of the best navigators I have ever seen. Wonderful. Uh, when we took off, we left Gander Bay, Newfoundland to fly over the ocean to our base. But you didn't fly directly. We had to fly through the an island called Lagan in the Azores, about 500 miles off the coast of Portugal. Now, Portugal is a neutral country. They're supposed to not be having us there, but we had a huge air base there. And uh, it was a very interesting place. But anyway, we started out, it was New Year's Day, 1945. New Year's, not New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. The wings were covered with snow. Well, I, I put snow covers on before in the wings. We had these canvas covers you cover the wings with. And I had to get out there around, oh, before midnight and get those covers off and <coughs> uh, run up the engines. And what happened was my navigator said, something is wrong. You fly by something called a... Uh, no, no, you don't, you don't fly by a seat of your pants. You, you have a compass. Uh, what's a, I forget the name of the compass. You have three, three different compasses. You, you were, what, what are they? Radio compass. He, was, he said, this is radio compass is showing we're going the wrong direction. And I said, that, we shouldn't be going here. So he sat down, he, said, he, he charted a course. He got up in the, there's a little astrodome here, right, a tiny little glass top here in the top. He stands up in there with a sextant, and he, on the North Star, he sets his own course like a navigator in a ship. And he, he did a beautiful job. We were a little worried, and uh, we were staying up at night, flying all night. We had never flown across the ocean before because I, was nine, I, was 19, I wasn't even 19. I was 19 years old then. My pilot was 21. My co-pilot was 21, I think. My navigator was 20. My bombardier was 20. And the gunners were 18. So we had never flown across. Oh my, the only old, the old man of the crew, we used to call him the old man. He was the radio operator, Stuart McAllister. He was 23. But we considered him a pretty old guy. Uh, and uh, we uh, were flying across the ocean. And I, I must have dropped off standing up. And I'd stand up between the pilot and co-pilot, like holding onto the backs of their seats and watching the instruments, checking the gauges. I must have collapsed, and I, we were wearing these heavy flying clothes. We left Newfoundland, and we were bundled up terribly. And we got there, and we started peeling off our clothes. We, I saw the island in the distance. Oh, how happy we were we reached there. Uh, now, it's going on the, with these guys. Uh, here was my... Oh, thank you. And, and when you're over here, stand further back so the light will see. Oh, back. okay. Uh, here's my tail gunner. He's the only. Is this all right? Yes. All right. Let me get out of the way here. He's the only one we couldn't find. We don't know what happened to him. We all searched for him too. 
uh, recently, and we don't know where he got to. Here is uh, Ken Pianzio. He was only eight, well, he was, nine, he was 18 or 18 there. Ken was a, a nice kid from <clears throat> Western Pennsylvania. Very nice boy. And uh, let's see in the bottom. Did I get to him? That's McAllister, Stuart R. McAllister. He was our radio operator from Oregon. He now lives in California, and I was talking to him on the phone just the other night. Uh, and let's see, here, I, I already uh, talked to him. He was a, a co-pilot, co -pilot. yeah. And I took uh, low and cry. And here was an interesting character. When we called him on the phone, he didn't want to be bothered with us. He was very cold and indifferent. He had moved to Pittsburgh. He had a twin brother who was flying, uh, he's our bombardier. He was flying his uh, bombardier, and his twin brother was in the uh, second bomb group. And even though they didn't have bombardiers as such in World War I, his father was in the second bomb group in World War I. <laughs> and he and his twin brother, he was an interesting character. He, uh, he came from a, quite a wealthy family on the main line. And uh, he, I remember, <laughs> he wrote, we slept in the most primitive method. That's why the, uh, the newsmen didn't want to come there. We had very primitive things. And they didn't come there because they could have nice places in England to visit and stay in nice places. People all spoke English there. <clears throat> he wrote to his mother that he was we had Italian workers on the fields, all over the field, and for $300, they would build you one of these Italian, uh, I don't know, they made of stone huts, like uh, to live in. It's much more comfortable than living in a tent. And he and another uh, man in the group, I don't remember who it was, were, go were going to build a home. He says he's going to build a little home there. His mother didn't understand, and she sent him this very expensive silverware, cocktail glasses, and <laughs> all the stuff, curtains, and all that stuff for his home, for his new, for his housewarming. She had no understanding at all what was happening. <laughs> yeah, but he, uh, he moved to Pittsburgh, and I called him in Pittsburgh, and he just uh, fluffed us off. Some of the other fellows called him, too, because we just found out where we were just recently. And uh, that, yeah. Now, this character was the ball turret gunner and I pitied him I pitied him because he uh, we just knew him as Shorty that's what we called him uh, I, don't, I don't want to mention any names with him but he, he lives in the, he originally came from Chicago too but he lives in the, out in Colorado outside of Denver we used to sleep on these cots just canvas cots and sometimes and we'd be sitting around in the daytime, and he'd sit up. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to have my back toward you. He'd sit up and uh, with his eyes wide open, but he was asleep. And he'd say, flak. See, you have to call out flak when, when, when some burst near you to let the gunners know, you know where the flak is. Flak, 4 o'clock level, flak, uh, 4 o'clock low, you know, and all the low flak he could see, but he was down there. And he'd start calling out flak. Fighter coming in, 4, four o'clock low. And uh, he says, he, he, he was his eyes were open. So the guys, they didn't mean anything, but they, they didn't know. They were very cruel. They said, uh, hey, Shorty, we're hit. We're going down. And he hollered, no, I don't, where's my chute? Where's my chute? They say, well, we don't know where your chute is. We're leaving. Goodbye. And he'd scream and yell. And, and then he'd wake up. And he'd say, what are you guys laughing at? What are you guys laughing at? I, I was, uh, as the engineer, I was a tech sergeant at Five Stripes. I was actually in charge of the enlisted men. And in the Air Force, you don't give people orders like that. You know, you're, you're with the men all the time. I say, hey, it's not right to do. That's a terrible thing to do. And they didn't seem to understand it. Oh, he, he doesn't know what he's doing. And, you know, he would do this all the time. Now, you notice one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Oh, yeah. This fella. They gave to us. We were trained for a nine-man crew. But uh, this fella was, had a job on the field as a mechanic, 
and then he was washing airplanes down with these long brushes. <clears throat> but he heard that if you fly a certain amount of missions, you go home in a hurry. He never thought that you can get killed as a, uh, you know, a gunner or shot up. Uh, Vic risked that. Incidentally, he's a big inventor today, but he, he'd screw up in everything he did, everything he did over there. Uh, how, he, how he got to our, our group was he, uh, well, he, he, volunt he, went, he went to gunnery school. He went to gunnery school, but in gunnery school, before you ever even fly in an airplane, you have to learn land gunnery. They put you on, on a field with a, a 30 caliber machine gun, and their targets, they look like sails passing along on a, a mechanical line. You have to shoot. You got colored bullets, and they, they count the color of the holes. He was there, and he, ca he came from a farm. He had never really been to the city much in Wisconsin. His father had a dairy farm. And he was 18. <coughs> a, a, a man that has a little tower in back of him, the uh, captain. And he hollered out, you, number four. And he turns the machine gun, yeah, yeah. And uh, well, he shot the. Uh, the captain and, and the scrotum of all <laughs> and uh, they, he, he was found not guilty. He's very lucky. <laughs> a mistake, and they're not guilty. So they, they shipped him uh, over to us. He was riding on the back of it. We, we used to go to the beach called Manfredonia Beach. It's a beautiful beach, a little fishing village down. So we hop aboard the back of a truck, and the roads were hazardous there. And they drive us to the beach in the summer, uh, a day we're not flying. <clears throat> he just dropped on his truck, and these drivers were wild. And the driver was driving crazy. And he, he knew it, and he banged on the top, you know, where they let you off. He said, let me off here. Got off, they went down the road, and the truck went over and over a cliff. He got saved, but the rest of the men didn't. Uh, he was taking a shower in another, not in our outfit, in another. And uh, it's just, a, you know where the shower is? They put uh, the belly tank up with holes in the bottom, and you pull like a chain, and the water comes out. And uh, enlisted men could have hot water only certain hours of the day. Well, what we had to do was run from our tents. It was across a big highway. Not big, none of the highways were big in Italy where we were, but they were, you know, long highway, but it was narrow. We run across the highway, and even in the dead of winter, the guys never dressed or anything. They went completely nude. They run across the highway, and uh, they go in the shower and run back again to their tent and get dressed up. But he, he was in the shower, and this fighter plane was having engine trouble, sputtering, and he saw it coming down. He ran out of the shower, and a guy crashed right in the shower stall. He wasn't scratched. These things would happen to Vic, and when he came to our outfit, people were a little worried, you know, he might be a jinx, <laughs> flying, flying with a man like that. Uh, I, I, the reason I'm telling you this, it, I know it doesn't pertain to the B-17, but the characters you meet, I grew up in there and I learned about characters. You won't believe it, but I was a very quiet kid, very sort of refined in many ways, and I learned otherwise as I <laughs> got older. Uh, he, uh, the, the things he did, we had a, a man named Murphy, he had the most colorful crew, and I always said, someday I'm going to write a book about Murphy's crew. On the side, see, we didn't, like most, most uh, B-17 outfits, they would fly, uh, fly where they put a picture of something on the side with writing. But we had so many ships in the 342nd Squadron, we would fly whatever they assigned us that for that mission. This one crew flew mostly one plane. It was called, it had this slinky looking girl lying with a tight evening gown with a slit all the way up here, holding a cigarette with a cigarette holder in one hand and a champagne glass in the other with bubbles coming out of it. And it was called the Bitter Bitch. <laughs> and on their jackets, they had the same picture on all their jackets. And they were all certifiably crazy. And I, I, I mean this, I'm not exaggerating. They were nuts. I, I went into operations office and I told them, you can court-martial me when I had to fly. It's every once in a while, if a man was sick, he took his place from another crew on a mission. They were really certifiably crazy. I'm, sta I'm, I'm in a top turret there, you know, and um, it was, uh, and uh, Murphy's crew, and his co-pilot used to practically sleep, hat over his eyes, his feet up on the dashboard, you know, and uh, I, and I, uh, they start really putting the flack up pretty bad. 
And uh, these guys are talking over, you're not supposed to talk over intercom on a bomb run. That's a silence only between the pilot and navigator. Hey, Murphy, get the hell off here. We're going to get, uh, you know, let's, let's go over to, to Switzerland and get out of this damn thing. And, you know, stuff like that. And I never heard stuff. You're not, you're supposed to be, that's when you have discipline in an airplane, when you're over to bomb run. And they're talking like that. And then I hear someone holler, hit the silk, bail out, bail out. And I get my shoot on, my chest shoot. It was right on the floor beside me. And I have the door that leads into the bomb bay beside me. And I walk toward the bomb bay. And the co-pilot looks and reaches back and pulls me back and shouts, you're only kidding. <laughs> I was going to jump out. It was over the uh, Alps Mountains, too. But uh, I said, what kind of crazy people are these? Uh, now, his crew, he was shot down three times. I never heard of anyone shot down three times. And he managed to get back. Once he landed where the Germans and the Russians were fighting. And uh, they, the Russians got him. The Germans got three of his men. The Russians got him. And they start beating him up. They thought he was a German paratrooper. Well, actually, in, in a little zipper pocket here, we're supposed to carry something in four languages and learn it. I am an American flyer, four different languages. Please take me to the nearest Allied post. And they evidently didn't bother with it. And he didn't speak German, and he says, Americano, Americano, but he knew the Italian. And they didn't know. They just were beating him up and beating his friends up. And then, uh, he, he st I forget what he said, but he said something which they understood. And they went over and they liked it. They realized he was an American. They took him into their uh, area where they ate and drank. Now, the Russians had something very strange. They judged a man by how much liquor he could hold. It was very important to them. And so they filled up water glasses. They were drinking vodka and they say, Roosevelt, Stalin, Churchill, boom. But, and after the first one or so, he was out. They had a character. But he got, he got them, uh, the Russians did get him to Romania. From Romania he got back to our, uh, our lines. But Murphy would do things which, well, I don't want to go on and on, but it, it was just unbelievable. Unbelievable what he did. And then we, there was a guy in the outfit, an, uh, a bombardier, they called Arab Joe. I never knew his real name. But he never wore his uniform. He used to wear a pair of fatigues, no signs of being an officer. And he used to wear one of those straw hats they wear from down. So he was from Mississippi. And he, w he was highly intelligent. You never know to look at him or talk to him. He went to the University of uh, Mississippi, Old Miss. And he majored in uh, uh, Semitic languages, you know, Arabic and some, uh, Aramaic and all those there. And he used to uh, write out sheets of paper in German, vote for Arab Joe for mayor of uh, Vienna or wherever we were bombing. Vote for Arab Joe for the governor, you know. And he'd drop him out over with the bomb. <laughs> he, he was, he was, and oh, he, he did something really strange. There's a, in the Air Force, they used to say, we hit him with everything but the kitchen sink. He went to an old junk dealer along the road there and bought a kitchen sink and dropped that out. And on the side of his plane, but we hit him with the kitchen sink. <laughs> Very strange people. Uh, I don't know what time I'm supposed to, maybe I'm going over. Am I going over? Am I okay? All right. Uh, it, it, it's very, very strange. Uh, they, uh, in the 341st, they had a Puerto Rican fellow who was the commanding officer there, uh, Lieutenant Gonzalez, first Lieutenant Gonzalez. And on Saturdays, he used to fly a B-17 up to Rome and fill it with prostitutes and bring him back to a squadron. And uh, the, uh, in our outfit, they wouldn't dare do that because Captain Muscogenus was a strickler for rules and everybody knew that. But the, and he used to have to make a ritual speech when the 17 was coming in with all these girls on it. He used rough language, which I won't repeat, but he used to say, if you can't have your women, let's say that, you can't fight. I want to see a woman in every town tonight. <laughs> Well, uh, Father Brown was our uh, squ uh, squadron, uh, well, he was a group. They didn't have squadron, uh, uh, yeah, he was Catholic. But it could be anybody, it could have been a Protestant, but they just chose one to be for the whole bomb group. And Father Brown got up right after he made his speech. He didn't know Father Brown was even in the audience. 
Father Brown said, your commanding officer ought to be ashamed of himself, and he started damning him and all that sort of thing. And then when Father Brown left, Lieutenant Gonzalez got up and says, what Father Brown says is true. He says, but you know why I did this? I looked at those girls as they got off the plane, and if I saw one that didn't look clean, I took her for myself to save you men from her. <laughs> and this, this was the, this, this was the, this is the kind of things that you remember, they stick with you. <laughs> Where are you in the picture? What? Where are you in the picture? Oh, tonight, uh, I'm the skinny guy, you'd never know it. Here. Second one on the top. Uh, I was 19 there. Yeah, that's, and there's our toilet facility in our, in our tent area. My radio operator is uh, posing for it. And that's another toilet facility. We had it all over, all over. They would dig holes and put these four inch pipes in the ground around our tent area. That's why, the, that's why many of the uh, people from the news media didn't come. That's the kind of things they'd have to live with. And that's my pilot outside his tent. Yes. What? That's a door. Oh, oh, that's that side is the. Uh, it's a heater for. It got so cold in the winter, damp and cold. And what what they do is take an old oil drum. And here's another thing that drives me crazy about people think oh these great heroes and all. there's wooden floors if you see planks how do you get planks there's hardly any wood in southern Italy the Italians years ago cut down all their trees there are very few trees you know in southern Italy the trees are in the north well the Colonel Muscogenus would say I want to see I don't want to see any tent without a floor in it you don't live like animals you know where are you gonna get the wood you managed to get it so what men would do if they didn't have a floor is crawl out to the airfield. Now they had armed guards, you know, guarding up and back with a rifle, you know, the airfield. You weren't allowed there at night. And they'd sneak up and they'd go up like 20 feet at a time when the guard was down the other end. And they had these crates that they shipped engines in, wooden crates, uh, empty crates that would throw them away. So they'd pull the crates like 20, 30 feet and hide behind the crate till the guard gets to the other end, till they get it out across the highway. Then they take it to their, break it up and make a floor for their tent. Now, they saw the writing right on there. Nobody cared. You were allowed to steal them, as long as you weren't caught. <laughs> that was the idea. You could steal them, but you weren't allowed to get caught. You know, they don't tell you these things when you, you, know, you read about them. Uh, it, was, it was very interesting. But we, we, we didn't have to do that because, yes, here's my tail gunner, McAllister, my radio operator, Hood, Bill Hood, and this is me. Uh, Mo Leeming, no, that's Mo Leeming. I don't even know who that was. No, I don't know. I don't recognize him. That's it. Are there any more of those? Uh, that's our B-17, 772. That's the one we flew across the ocean with, a brand new B-17. We weren't allowed to uh, bring a lot of stuff with it, but they. While we're flying it, they gave a lot of blankets to bring over there, stuff that the men needed. And when we were in Memphis, for some reason, I don't remember why I was in Memphis, liquor was hard to get. And I wanted to bring some with us. I went into the store there. Now they have state stores in the, there, like we do here. And they did have some, uh, something called Southern Comfort. And I got a lot of bottles of it. I don't like it, but it's sweet. It's sickening. I got a lot of bottles of it, but how are you going to hide it when the inspector comes through to inspect your plane? I taped some underneath the fuse box. I t in the tail wheel uh, well, I taped some there, and I was hoping that when the wheel, wheel came up, nothing happened. <laughs> Didn't break or anything. I taped some, and then I put them all over the place. Because I was the engineer, I knew the plane pretty well. And uh, they... Uh, they didn't catch us. We got it. And I remember when we landed in uh, Tunisia, in Tunis, we were, believe it or not, when we got there, we were snowed in. Uh, not bad snow, light snow, but uh, we were weathered in. We couldn't fly. So we had to stay in Tunis for a while. 
And uh, Tunis is a very interesting place. You, uh, I went to, we went to town, but they wouldn't allow us to go to town because they, their rationale for such a thing was that we put so much money into you and it's very dangerous in, the, in those Arab towns at night. And we don't want anything to happen to you because we'll lose all our investment. And uh, there was a place called the, uh, the Medina, which is a Kasbah. They call, the Arabs called the Medina. It was, there were some nice sections to it. Uh, so we wanted to see it, and we got, we got somebody got a, uh, it was a chaplain, I don't remember who it was, got us uh, just permission, but they said, you must be back before nightfall. You cannot be there at nightfall. And we went to a restaurant, and the guys ordered four bottles of French wine and uh, their food. They wanted to see what the uh, food was like. And I couldn't eat the food because I don't eat meat. That's what about all they had. So I was drinking wine, we're all drinking it, and I don't know what happened to the rest of the guys. Uh, uh, two of us sort of sign above these walls with curved entrances. It said, do not enter the Medina, off limits to all Allied troops. So we went in. And we, uh, we walked around there for a while, and the Arabs are sitting on the curb selling everything, and there's, they'd always call you uh, Joe. You speak, Joe. You speak, Joe. That means you give the first price and you bargain with them to get it down. And uh, there, there was one guy that had medicine bottles full of essence of, uh, oh, what's that famous woman's perfume? Uh, Chanel. Chanel number five, yeah. They, they get the raw essence from there. And, but it, actually, and to use it, you have to mix it with ambergris. You've got to get ambergris somewhere. But this would have made about a gallon of Chanel number no. 5. So I, I figured my mother and sister would love this if they could find a way. So I got, bought a bottle, I think it was $8, $8 in American money, eight fifty something like that, in their money. Uh, and uh, an MP Jeep came through. And I jumped in the doorway and flattened myself, and they passed. And... Uh, but I dropped the bottle. It broke, and it splat. The raw essence.